A teenage boy was shot and killed at a Fort Worth apartment complex. They say the eighth grader was attempting to burglarize a woman's home and the woman shot him. Fox Force Peggy Edgar is in Fort Worth tonight, Peggy. Steve and Fort Worth police tell us this woman is cooperating with the ongoing investigation. The woman told officers that she had previously reported break ins at her apartment. Police also tell us no arrests have been made. Fort Worth police say a 14 year old was fatally shot on this front lawn of an apartment near I 20 and McCart Avenue. Just before 3 a.m. Thursday, officers were dispatched to a woman's 911 call of an attempted burglary. Officers responded and then left to finish the report. A short time later, the same woman made a second 911 call stating the burglar was back. Fort Worth police responded again. This time they found a teenage boy with a gunshot wound to the chest lying on the ground. Police say the female caller shot the teenager who died on scene. Thursday afternoon, the apartment was quiet. Two bullet holes were seen on the front wall. Detectives say the renter had reported break-ins or attempted break-ins prior to Thursday. Fox 4 learned the teenager was an eighth grader at Fort Worth ISD's Rosemont Middle School, just a few miles away. But I connect with these kids like that. So Derwin Lamb was set to have a mentoring session with the teenager at school on Thursday. Lamb has multiple community youth programs in North Texas where he shares his previous life experiences to hopefully guide children and teens on the right path. Just before Lamb was about to leave for the middle school, he received a text from the boy's teacher saying he'd been shot and killed. Today was just like, dang, you know, I, I just, I wasn't expecting that. You know, even though I expected, unfortunately, in, in the community of the things that happen in, in the culture, um, I wasn't expecting that today. And so that, that, that hurt me. And while we were out at the scene this afternoon, I spoke with the teenager's mother. They live in the same apartment community. She told she tells me that her son left the apartment sometime during the middle of the night and she found out when her other daughter ran in and woke her up. After the passage of a new state law, some of the first alleged fentanyl dealers here in North Texas are being charged with murder. Hello, everybody. I'm Heather Hayes. I'm Steve Eager. It's 9 o'clock. The Tarrant County District Attorney announced Jacob Lindsay will be charged with murder for supplying fentanyl, leading to a deadly overdose. And prosecutors in Denton County announced they charged two people with murder for allegedly supplying the same deadly drugs. Fox Forest Blake Hansen is live in Denton tonight with the story. Blake. As Stephen Heather, these are two separate cases, both announced by law enforcement today. What is yet to be seen is whether these cases could be difficult to prosecute and also whether it will be, make a big enough dent in the uphill battle against fentanyl. In mid-October, first responders found a 29-year-old North Carolina man dead in this hotel near I-35 and May Hill Road in Denton. The cause of death later ruled to be a combination of cocaine and fentanyl. Then to police say 38 year old Tabitha Ballin admitted to giving the man the drugs, which police say she got from 37 year old Raymond Hernandez. Both are now charged with murder. Meanwhile, in Fort Worth, the grand jury indicted 47 year old Jacob Lindsay for murder after police there say he dealt 26 year old Brandon Harrison fentanyl lace drugs outside the Hewlin Mall in mid September. Harrison was found dead the next day in a sober house for recovering addicts. The cases were made possible after a new Texas law went into effect in September that allows prosecutors to charge fentanyl dealers with murder. We need to let people understand this is not a game anymore. Kathy O'Keefe founded Winning the Fight, which provides drug education, support and resources after the loss of her son Brett to an accidental overdose in 2010. She says the more serious penalties might help draw more attention to the severity of fentanyl. If those murder cases lead up to people paying attention, then we need those because we, this is not a good place, not for our country, not for our families, not for anybody, our military. This is not a good situation. But some do fear it puts the focus on low level dealers without addressing the problem at the source. Roderick White is an attorney not connected to the cases. The focus should be higher up the distribution uh, uh, scheme. Penalizing that guy that's selling this for 5 or $10 in a gas station parking lot 
and calling him a murderer only allows government to say, hey, look, we're doing something about the fentanyl crisis while never having to address who's making it, how are they getting it into our communities. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, there are a lot of resources available. We've posted information to one of those sources winning the fight on our website, fox4news.com. Man is dead from a police-involved shooting in Mesquite. Officers now searching for two people who ran away. Started with an officer investigating a stolen vehicle. The father of the man who died has questions about what happened. Fox 4 Stephen Dial spoke to that father and the police about their investigation. Stephen? Still limited information and still a kind of confusing story. Two vehicles were in the parking lot of the 7-Eleven early this morning. One a stolen vehicle and one the not stolen. The driver in the not stolen vehicle is dead. And as you mentioned, his family is asking for more answers. It was around 3 Thursday morning when investigators say an officer spotted a stolen vehicle at a 7-Eleven near Cartwright Road. As he was making contact in the parking lot of the 7-Eleven store at that intersection, uh, he learned there was a second vehicle following or associated with that vehicle. Um, there was an interaction with the second vehicle that resulted in the officer firing at the second vehicle and striking one of those occupants. That occupant, the driver, was the only person shot and died on the scene. But the circumstances of the interaction, what led to the shooting, are still unclear. According to police, two people in the first vehicle, the stolen car, ran away. After the shooting, police arrested three others in the second vehicle. Police say they also found multiple guns in that car. My daughter called me and uh, someone had gotten in touch with her because he was in her car. The car belonged to the daughter of Stephen Lawrence. We met him at the police department Thursday morning. Lawrence told us his 19-year-old son, Peyton, was the driver of the car, and that investigators are still trying to review video of the incident. He definitely wasn't in the stolen car, so um, we just want to get together and see what happened with why you would shoot through a front windshield of somebody that's just sitting in a car. Police did not identify the driver, but said the person had an AR-style pistol. We do not know if the officer told supervisors he saw the weapon before he shot into the car. There is no description of the suspects from the stolen car that got away. Well, whether they live close by and made it home, it does not appear to be that they are a threat to the community in any way. While Lawrence and his family want more details from police, they hope those details provide more answers. So one of the kids was arrested, and, and uh, so maybe they can get with him and find out what happened and get the story on what actually happened um, and if Peyton was actually involved. Now, we have not gotten any new details about this investigation since the initial interview done with officers early this morning. Uh, they did say that they're reviewing multiple different types of video, including the cameras at the 7-Eleven. Three people accused of running a sex trafficking ring in Collin County have been arrested. Among them is the man police say was in charge. Fox Force Paige Ellenberger live in the Plano neighborhood where all this went down, Paige. Yeah, good morning. So a broken fence in the back of this house and the boarded up entryway shows the history of an FBI raid here at this Plano home. Now, I do want to show you video captured by Sky 4 on Monday, and it, it shows local police and federal agents surrounding this rental home on Sowerby Drive near Parker and Coit Roads here in Plano. Police say this is where 40-year-old William Garland lives. He's accused of running a sex trafficking ring. They shared an earlier mugshot of Garland with us. Investigators say his arrest is a result of a years-long investigation. Two others were also arrested in relation to this ring. 24-year-old Jalen Bobo and 27-year-old Roberta Kahn. All three are accused of recruiting young women to work as escorts. And according to the FBI, those women were offered often violently forced into sex work. Police say this case isn't solved yet. They believe more people are involved in this ring across Cullen County. So they're asking anyone with any information to come forward and contact Plano Police. Now, if convicted, Garland and Bobo could face life in prison. Meanwhile, Khan may face up to 20 years in prison. Live in Plano this morning, I'm Paige Ellenberger for Good Day. A woman who cut off her ankle monitor and fled the country while awaiting trial for murder 
is now sentenced to life in prison. Good evening, I'm Clarice Tinsley. Lisa Dykes showed no emotion when she learned her sentence. Dykes stabbed Maricela Botello to death and dumped her body in 2020. The murder described as a result of jealousy. Fox Wars David Centendry live at the Dallas County Courthouse with the update, David. Yeah, remember, Lisa Dykes was on the run before her first arrest, and then she bonded out and, with her wife, fled to Cambodia, 9,000 miles away. Lisa Dykes is described as a savvy paralegal, her wife an attorney. When they were captured over in Cambodia, one FBI agent testifies that Dykes' reaction was to look her right in the eyes and ask, well, what jurisdiction do you have over here? Tonight, Dykes' reaction was basically nothing when she was sentenced to life in prison for murder. We, the jury, unanimously find the defendant, Lisa Jo Dykes, guilty of murder as charged in the indictment. Lisa Dykes will serve life in prison for the murder of Mary Sella Bateo. Ms. Dykes, I hope that you find that you've been treated with a much greater amount of dignity and respect than you ever treated Mary Sella Bateo Valadez. May God have mercy on your soul. Bateo was reported missing in October 2020 after leaving Deep Ellum with Charles Beltran. Dykes, her wife Nina Morano, and Beltran were in a three-way relationship. Beltran testified that Dykes stabbed Bateo to death in a jealous rage because she found Bateo in bed with Beltran. Bateo's remains were found six months later. Dykes, Morano, and Beltran were on the run, but ultimately found and charged with murder. Morano and Beltran's murder charges, however, were dismissed Friday. The two still faced tampering with physical evidence charges. Dykes is convicted of tampering. A 20-year sentence added to her her life sentence. Both verdicts are signed by the presiding juror. Dykes' defense attorney, Heath Harris, asked jurors for a lighter sentence based on Beltran's testimony. Harris believes it was a crime of passion, a term recognized by Texas law that can reduce a murder sentence. For some reason, she lost it that night. That's sudden passion. That's what you heard from the witness stand. Prosecutors disagreed and pushed for life in prison. There's no need for rehabilitation for Ms. Dykes. It's just not necessary. She had all the tools to do the right things in life and to lead a good life without murdering an innocent 23-year-old. My mother right there crying. Bateo's younger brother delivered a victim impact statement on behalf of his family to Dykes. I hope that you get what you deserve in that prison cell. Defense attorney Keith Harris says he has submitted a notice of appeal. However, he says he believes the judge gave a fair trial.